Well, good morning. And as you can see, I am not Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick is in Arkansas visiting family. And uh, this is a little bit of a unique trip for he and Miss Joy because um, Richard and Eden went on vacation and they are on full time Emory duty this week. And I talked with him, he's doing all right. But he said, Brandon, I do have a renewed appreciation for people in your stage of life and especially moms in your stage of life with young children. So he might need another vacation to get caught up on some sleep once he gets back here. But I know that he's going to be back here. He's going to be caught up on sleep and ready to bring the word for us next week. But this week, I'm going to continue on in the series that we are in called Love Intentionally. We're going to look at the next part of the passage that we've been going from in this series. So let's go ahead and take a look at that passage. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through eight. And it says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So a few weeks ago, we kicked off this series and Pastor Rick started on talking about the beginning. Love is patient and love is kind. This week, we're going to take the next three and we've shifted gears. Instead of go and do, we're looking at the not list. And these three, the envy and boasting and pride, they all kind of go together. They kind of work together. So we're going to talk about all three this morning. But first, we want to dive in. What do these things mean? What is envy? What is boasting? And what is pride? So envy is, it's like a boiling over. It's like a, it's a thought, it's a desire that we have in us, a strong desire uh, that works within our hearts that becomes almost bubbling up to the surface like a boiling. And it's a strong desire for something that someone else has. Now it could be stuff, it could be cars, it could be houses, it could be boats, those things. But that, that's the low hanging fruit. Let's just be honest. I think it's, easier for us to want things like someone else's relationship with their spouse. Or it might be easier for us to want something like someone's relationship with their kids or their grandkids. Or maybe it's easier for us to want someone else's good health. Maybe we find ourselves wanting the status, the influence, the job that someone else has. There's lots of different things that we can want, but there's also a second part to this jealousy definition. There's a jeal- there part that says, I want what someone else has. But the second part's a little more sinister. It says, if I can't have it, then I don't want you to have it. And that gets to be a little bit scary. That's the part that says, it's all about me. That's the part that says, this is going to be me. This is the part that if you are on social media and you see that person post another vacation that they're on and you just have to like silence and block that for 30 days and we'll be back to that. That's that part. The part that says, I don't want you to have what you have. So that's envy. It's something that happens within us, in our hearts, in our minds. The next one we have is boasting. We're going to talk it. We're going to call it bragging here this morning. And this is the action that comes out of us. The action that comes out of a job interview is we're building ourselves up. We're laying out what we can do, the things that we can do and how well we can do them so that we can help an organization so that we can help the team that we're trying to be a part of. But bragging doesn't do that. Bragging builds yourself up. So you look a little bit better than everyone else and then goes ahead and puts them down. Bragging says, I can do this. And have you met them over there? They're terrible at that. They're really, really bad. That's where bragging is. And so where envy is the thought and the feeling, the seed of that desire, bragging becomes the action that comes out of us. And the last one that we have is pride. And pride, the word used for pride, it's a word that um, is, is talking about being puffed up. 
It's talking about being inflated. A word that's associated with the Greek word that's used in this talks about a windbag, which would be a really great diss, but we're not going to talk about that. It's, it's talking about something that's big, something that has, has good size to it, but at the end of the day, it's full of nothing. It's full of hot air. And so those are the ideas of what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, in this series, we've been talking about how Jesus is love. He's the embodiment of this list of things. And so we're going to look at a passage this morning that talks about how Jesus is love. But then in addition to that, we're also going to look at the stark contrast between what Jesus being love looks like and what it looks like for someone who may be jealous who may be bragging, who may be a proud person. We're gonna look at a story that Jesus told, a parable that's well known in the Christian circles. It's even well known in our culture. It's a story that goes by the name of the prodigal son. Now, I don't want to assume that just anybody knows what the story is. So I'm gonna tell some of it to catch us up to speed on it. And the way this story starts out is there's a father, a wealthy father, and he has two sons. And these two sons, uh, they've spent much of their lives with him. And this younger, son's the younger son decides, I'm done being part of this family. I'm done with the responsibility of always having to go out and do the chores. I'm done with being associated to being the goody, goody family. Whatever it is, he decides, I'm done. This is where I'm getting off. And so he goes to his father and he asks for his inheritance. This would be wildly disrespectful. I mean, it would be very similar to today's world where someone, uh, if you went to someone and asked for your piece of the will before they were gone, ultimately he's saying he wishes his dad was gone. He wishes his dad has already passed away so that he can get his piece of the pie and get out. And this father who we'll see later is full of compassion, decides to do it gives him the inheritance, that part that's his. And the son says, thank you, and he's out. It doesn't take too terribly long before we find out that he ends up wasting all the money away. He finds himself in a spot with no food, no money, no friends, ultimately no identity. He's hungry, he needs money, he finds someone in town who's willing to hire him to take care of the chores with the pigs. He's at a spot where he's so low, where he's got nothing else to him that he can't even wait till payday. He's so hungry. He decides he's going to dip into what the pigs are eating, which all of us Iowans know that that's not anything that any of us want a part of. And it's in that spot that he says, man, even my father's servants have it better than I do right now. I've got an idea. I think I can swallow enough pride to go back and ask if I can be a servant for my father. Then I'll at least can stay in the servant's quarters. Then I can at least make a little bit of money and be able to eat something. So that's what he does. Now the father being full of compassion, he's so much better than I would have been because even though he was so offended, even though he was so hurt by the actions of his brother or of his son, he sits like any good father would, loving, waiting, anticipating for the day that maybe his son will change his mind and come home. Some of this might have looked like him actually sitting and waiting. Maybe he had a servant that was waiting. I don't know. I get lost in my imaginations with it. But regardless, he was waiting. He was waiting day in and day out for the chance that maybe, just maybe, his son was going to come home. And that's exactly what ends up happening. His son makes the decision that he's going to end up coming home. So in this message... I browse over the younger son because there's a lot of really good sermons on the younger son. This one may or may not be a good sermon, but it's gonna be on the older son also. And the older son, because he talks, he lives, he lives out these ideas that we're talking about here. 
to the father. He's waiting for his son to show up. He ends up seeing him. And that's where we pick up We're in Luke chapter 15 and it's verse number 20. And he says, he got up, he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I just wanted to point out that is the father's compassion. It says he's full of compassion. He was waiting. He runs out to meet him. I'm not even going to let you get up to the house. I'm running out. We're going to meet in the street. It's a big, big meeting here. One that he's been praying for and hoping for, for a long time. Verse 22, it says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine is de was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, though, the older son was in the field and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked, what is going on? Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. This father was able to put aside all of the offense. He was able to put aside all of the things that had happened against him with this, old, with this younger son. And he pulls him in and he says, let's celebrate. You were gone, you were dead, and now you're alive again. We have to celebrate. The older son doesn't end up feeling the same way. And that's what we see in the next verse. In verse chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 28, it says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat that I could celebrate with my friends. But when, his son, when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. I just wanna point out these themes within the older brother. The first one we see in verse 28, that right there at the beginning, it says that he was angry and he refused to go in. This is that part of the jealousy meaning that says, if I can't have it, then I don't want you to have it. It says, you can have your party over here, but I'm not going to attend. I'm not going to be a part of this party. Then he goes on in his jealousy and he ends up saying later in verse 29, he goes down and it says that you didn't even give me a goat that I was able to celebrate with. He says, I wanted what he has. I wanted the fatted calf. I wanted the big party. I've wanted all of these things and you didn't even give me a goat. He says, that, that is the two themes of this jealousy happening in one space. I wanted this, I didn't get it. And now I don't want my brother to have it. But we see he was also bragging. He starts by saying, look what all I've done in verse 29. Look at all the things that I've accomplished. I was here for, with you the whole time. And then he goes on into the bragging part that puts others down. And look how he spent his inheritance. Look what he decided to do with what you gave him. I've treated you, I've treated your stuff. I've treated everything in this, everyone in this family so much better than he did. We have jealousy, we have the bragging and it leads us with this inflated view. This person who's puffed up, arrogant, proud, and ultimately the one person not in the party. Not because the father didn't want him there, because the father pleaded for him to come in. And so as you and I strive to be people who are known for our love, we have to make sure that we're not being people who are jealous, not being people who are bragging and not being people who are puffed up. 
When we come back, we're gonna dive into how we can apply this a little further. Thank you guys. So as we've been in this series, we've been talking about how Jesus is love. Jesus is the embodiment of love. And in this story that Jesus is telling, this parable that Jesus is telling, he's telling us that, he told us that the father of the story is a picture of God. It's a picture of God and how he would end up being. And so I wanted to point out a few things within this story that we can look at just to look at what the love looks like. The first thing that I see when I look at the story is I see that the father of the story is so meek and humble. I mean, I love my boys, but if I was put in a situation like this, there's a good chance I'd like to say, how about we be a servant for maybe six or 12 months? And maybe we can draw up what that would look like to bring you back into the family and what it would look like for us to trust you again. Cause I mean, you burned us pretty bad, didn't you? But that's not what we end up seeing in this picture. We see a father who welcomed his son right back in and said, you are absolutely going to be part of the family. He wasn't concerned if he was going to be burned again. He swallowed his pride. He humbled himself and said, let's get the party going. Let's get back to being a part of this family. But one of the other things you see with this father is that he's so generous. We don't know the story on how he ended up with all of these riches and everything that he had, but we know that it didn't come free. And yet he wanted his sons to enjoy it. He wanted to give it to them. He wanted them to have a life that was similar to where his is, one that is full of riches, one that's full of gifts, one that is a generous life so that they could go on and be generous as well in that. So we have a father who was meek and humble. We have a father who is generous. We have a father who defined the identities of his sons. That one seems a little bit different, but I think it's really important. See, the father called his sons, well, exactly that, sons, family. He called them loved. And they were given that love at birth. They didn't work for the love. I didn't obey, I followed you and I served you and I was loyal. And now the father gave love. The father gave love from the very beginning. He says, you have all of my love. And for the other son, he had all of the father's love at birth. He says, you are loved, you can't lose my love. It doesn't matter what decisions you, doesn't, you make. It doesn't matter where you go. Because you are my son, you are loved. This is the scene that the father creates here, a, a scene where he wants his brothers, her sons to be happy for one another, happy for their brothers when they experience good things, when they experience the blessings of the father. And so the father identifies, or the father embodies this. You and I are supposed to be living as close like it as we can try this side of heaven. Lives that are marked as lovely people, people who don't have jealousy and don't have bragging and don't have pride or are trying to get rid of it when we do see it. So just as a reminder, the jealousy part that happens in our mind, that happens in our, in our heart, those are our boiling desires that we end up having. Bragging is the action that flows out. Pride is the result. And I think where you and I can begin to remove this from our lives, to be people who are known and marked for our love is at the level of jealousy. It's the seed to so much more evil within our lives. It starts all the way back at the very first sin. Adam and Eve are there and all of a sudden the serpent comes up and says, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to know what God knows? They had a choice in that moment. I could trust God. I could trust all that he's given us here in this garden with the exception of the one tree. And, and we can enjoy all of these things. But instead, the seed of jealousy took root. 
We see that in most sins that happen. Not long after that, you see it with Cain and Abel and the sacrifices that they offered. Not long after that, there's a guy named Joseph and all of his brothers were pretty jealous of him. And you just see that over and over and over again to the murder of Jesus and all the way until today. And so often it starts at this seed of jealousy. There's a verse in James chapter three, and it says that where this seed of jealousy is able to take root, there's gonna be disorder. There's gonna be conflict. There's gonna be every evil practice. This, this verse, I can attest, is so true. I see it every single day of my life. I have three boys and uh, one day there'll be a toy on the floor and it could be there all day long. That toy would be a um, Lightning McQueen Hot Wheels car right now. That is the toy, okay? And it's sitting there on the floor, just existing until one of my boys pick it up. And then there is the seed of jealousy. It gets planted, it takes root, and then there is disorder and chaos and every evil practice that happens after that. It's a thousand percent true in the snapshot of our home, but it's also a thousand percent true on bigger things in our life. And just follow your own mental processes when you see that vacation on social media again from that person. It starts out like, man, they're on another vacation, pretty lighthearted, but it goes further. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, another vacation. Okay, uh, what do they do for work? Do they ever spend any time together? Certainly those parents don't spend time with their kids. It can get pretty sinister pretty quickly when we allow that seed to take root and grow into something that gets pretty gross. And we can build a narrative around us that becomes not much more than an illusion, which is what we see here in this story. We see this in this parable that the older brother, he talks about all that he's achieved, all that he's earned, the loyalty to the family that he had. He didn't mess up. He followed the rules. He went above and beyond. He did all the things, but he didn't get to choose where he was born. He was born into the wealth. He was born into privilege. The father gave him the gift of a job to take care of the livestock, to take care of the crops. The father gave him the gift of his house and the things around him. The father gave him a gift of a future inheritance that he would have. The father gave him a gift of his love. Yet he thought he had earned it all. He thought it was all his own doing. He had created an illusion to where now all he can see is that someone else is getting gifts that they didn't earn. It wasn't about the father. It wasn't about the good gifts that the father had given. This is the beauty of 1 Corinthians 13. We can look at the passage. We can see what love looks like. When we put it together with all of these other things, we can see that the boasting and the pride and the, and the uh, envy, these things, there's no room for them in love. And we can also see that it's something we have to be intentional about. That's why with the series is loving intentionally because we have to be intentional about the actions that we're taking, but we also have to be intentional to not let these things creep in. So I have to say something that's probably not going to be a really popular thing, especially in this country. But none of us, whether you're in here, whether you're online, are self-made people. Here's what I mean by that though. We're all in this country, but none of us got to choose that we were born here. None of us got to choose the family that we were born into. None of us got to choose if we were gonna be really smart or just have the last name smart. None of us got to choose. <laughs> That's my last name for those listening online if you don't know who I am. <laughs> none of us get to choose these things. God gives us opportunities. God gives us different talents, different propensities in our lives that allow us to be in the space that we find ourselves in today. And one of the things I love about that is there's one gift that levels the playing field. 
Because we all have different gifts, different talents, different abilities here within this room, everybody online, there's so many diversities in what we can bring to the table. But there's one thing, one gift that every single person can experience. One gift that every single person can have if you choose to take it. It's the gift of grace the gift of our salvation. Because God modeled it when he sent his son to make a way for us to be able to have a relationship with him. Not to stand below him and wait for him to crack the whip when we mess up, but for us to be able to have a relationship with him. This is the verse I wanna leave you with. We have in this series, Pastor Rick has made it so practical for us where we've had actions to be able to go out and we wanna go do these things. Today, I have a little bit of a different application. It's gonna be one that's reflective. If you're looking for an instruction, my instruction would be read this verse every day and just pray over it this week. Pray that God brings this verse to life in you. I wanna highlight a couple things for you in this verse. It's Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10. Here's, how, here's what it says. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. That first line, for it's by grace. That means those of you with perfect church attendance, those of you who memorized every scripture, those of you who've followed all of the rules, none of those things are bad, but they didn't earn your salvation. It was a gift given to you. And that's the beautiful thing of the person over here. This would probably be more me who didn't follow any of the rules, who lived their life badly. Well, Brandon, like you've got that nice little haircut and that collared shirt on today. And like, you don't know how badly I lived my life. You're right, I don't, but guess what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one bit because God says, I have the gift of grace, a gift of salvation, a gift in my son that I wanna give to you should you choose to accept it. That's the beautiful thing of it. And so then that middle verse, verse number nine, where it says not by works so that we can't boast, there's nothing for us to boast in. Because as soon as I start to think, man, I really like what they have over there, they have the same thing I have, the same thing that was offered to me, God's grace, God's salvation. In the last verse, it's one of my favorite. All the students in the room are probably sick and tired of this verse because I say it most weeks, but, but for we're God's handiwork. He gives us an identity. Handiwork's not really a common word that we use here. Another word that's really similar to it is achievement. Or another essence of the word is that we are God's masterpiece. That's kind of makes you feel uncomfortable a little bit. Like I'm far from a masterpiece. This is what Paul says that God is, God says about us. You're his masterpiece. You are loved by him. Every one of us no matter how bad, no matter how good, loved by the Father as he offers you the gift of his grace. And then he gifts us all differently so that we can go do different good works for people. You get to go do good works over here and you get to go do good works over here. And I don't have to be jealous of the people over there because I know that God's given me good works to do here. He's given me good gifts to do here. And they don't have to be jealous of us because we can all just brag about how good God is as he's gifted each and every one of us. So I guess you could say that we're like a masterpiece with a mission, a mission to begin to practice contentment, a mission to begin to be happy for other people, rejoice with those who are rejoicing, a masterpiece that can be thankful for every good and every perfect gift that God has given us. And with this perspective, I hope that we can begin to be people that are not jealous of one another, but we can be happy for someone when we see them achieve something, when we see them have success, when we see them go on vacation, (laughs) or we can brag about how good God is. Man, 
Look what God's done in your life. Look what God's done in my life. Not for credit for me, because I can't boast. I'm just a masterpiece trying to be a masterpiece. (laughs) And then what would it look like for us to be people not marked by pride, but people who could love? The way 1 Corinthians talks about intentionally. God, thank you for the gift of your salvation. Thank you for the gift of grace and that it doesn't come with a terms and agreements list. God, I pray that you give us the boldness this week to look into this passage, to search ourselves, to allow you to search us. And God, maybe even the boldness to ask those closest to us where they see pride, where they see jealousy, where they see bragging in our lives. Because God, we want to be people who love the way that you did. We want to be people who represent you well here on this earth. And so God, I just pray that you give us that strength this week. I pray that you make us make known these things in our lives so that we can remove them and be people who look and talk and walk the way that you did. In your name we pray, amen.